Hello. So uh, we are going to be looking at how to do cell counts when we are guided by counter stains and what the boundaries are for particular brain areas. First, I thought I'd start out with a brain area that is very popular as far as addiction research, the nucleus accumbens, uh, without much differentiation between core and shell, although I know a lot of people are kind of interested in that. We're just trying to keep it simpler for something that's already a little bit complex. So for today, I'm going to be using uh, Fiji, uh, AKA ImageJ version two now they're on. Uh, I will be using my CFOS quantification protocol because I will be doing counts for nuclei rather than whole cells when it comes to neurons. And those are a slightly smaller size than a whole neuron. These will also be able to be used for other immediate early gene products like Delta Fos B, which is the focus of what I'm counting today. And so to get started, uh, we want to make sure that we have the Fiji. We want to make sure we have a rat brain atlas digital here with uh, Nissel stain plates able to be flipped back and forth between. Additionally, we will want to make sure that we have some sort of spreadsheet or documentation that we can dump things into. So uh, things that we will be having to record include the subject, what their sex is. When we have uh, their brain sectioned, it is in various series. So we could basically pull more tissue from the same subject that goes across the whole brain, just representative snapshots. So we stain a whole series at a time, but that leaves multiple series of brain tissue still from the same brain. So uh, for instance, this we labeled series C, uh, one that we just started staining for a subject we call, call series A or something. So we have that. Uh, if you're standing for multiple targets, you want to mention what the uh, coloring is or what the fluorophore is. Fluorescein is a green colored fluorophore. AMCA being used to stain CFOS is a blue colored fluorophore. And we're using diluted crystal violets as a counter stain in red. And so I have fluorescein, AMCA, and CV. Section thickness. Uh, I'll usually supply this for uh, anybody who's kind of taking this down in my uh, student assistant research stuff, but uh, we're assuming it's going to be around 50 to 60 micrometers. You want to write down the file name because then you could track it right back to the original file. Uh, presumed Atlas page, I kind of have figured this out for you in a lot of cases, but we could kind of just go with whatever it says here. Uh, it might say in the file as well. For instance, this one says P008 for the Atlas page file. So sometimes uh, that might be in the file name and that might be helpful to guide you as to what Atlas page to best refer to. You'll write down the region name that might also be in the file name. You will uh, have, at some point, you'll have a selection box. Uh, if it's a polygon selection, you'll kind of leave this blank or just maybe make a, put in the word polygon and you'll write down the X and Y coordinates that it gives you. Now, this one, this is probably one of the more important characteristics. Like this stuff, it's not super duper essential, except for the purpose of repeatability, if we have to go back and recount with uh, different threshold parameters. The threshold parameter in particular, that's important because that one uh, will determine what things are included in the counts and what things are just wiped away. We have the total counts that are given in the selection area. Uh, we can have it standardized if we have a box or an area measurement to plug into here. And then if there's any sort of other things that were done to the image, like in case we had to rotate it, I put that here. And that's relevant because the image that we're going to start with, I actually kind of need to rotate. So we're going to try that out. All right. So let's go ahead and open up an image. So file will open up some recent ones I was playing around with. We got our DFB image. Uh, we don't want to disable that. I'll show you that in a little bit. So we got this. Looks kind of dim, but there's stuff going on and it's actually super zoomed out. And then we'll open up the other image that goes along with this. So we have first our counter stain image. This is very thoroughly stained. We kind of got a lot of stuff going on here, a lot of little dots. We have our target stain image for DFB, a little typo up here that says P, just ignore that. And if we zoom in either using control plus or control mouse wheel forward, 
we can actually start seeing the individual nuclei. It's a little hazy because this is low magnification, but that's all we really need. We don't need a whole bunch of high magnification images to sort through. We just need to see the full scope of what's going on. It's hard to figure out exactly where the brain region boundaries are sometimes. And that's why we do a counter stain. But we have to be able to combine the counter stain image with the target stain image here. So let's go ahead and do that now. First, we'll go to color. So image color, merge channels. And we know that the DFB was stained green. So I'm going to select that here. And then the DAPI was used on this one, and that's in blue. We'll say create composite so it doesn't get rid of the uh, original images. We'll check this off as well. And let's go ahead and give it a go. So it'll create this image here. And in order to get the counter stain to pop out, you can color just the counter stain. You don't want to color adjust or amp up the coloring of the target because then it can falsely inflate or skew the data. So we definitely do not want to do that. Uh, we have the thresholding process for doing that instead. So not, not screwing up the data, but we have the thresholding process for basically getting the stained elements to pop out and then the non-stained or the uh, background stained elements to be dropped, as you'll see in a bit. So what we're going to do now is I happen to know that this image doesn't quite match the atlas as far as the direction it is. I'll show you that in a second. But first, the counter stain is still a bit dim. So we're going to do adjust, image adjust, uh, color balance. We're not going to mess with the green one. That's channel one in this case. We're going to try channel two, the blue one. And so you'll notice that if I decrease the maximum, it'll actually get the blue to start really popping out, which is helpful. We could make it pop out a lot. We don't have to worry about it being too much uh, because we're actually going to get rid of this blue channel later but this is how we can kind of play around with it. Then uh, if, it was, if there was too much background, if we wanted to get rid of that, we could increase the minimum. If we do that a lot, we can see that it drops out the image uh, pretty substantially. So we don't want to mess with the minimum in this case too much, maybe just tweaking it up just a tad. And that's fine. Um, probably not more than like 15, even like just leaving it as is might be fine, but eh, do it about there. We hit apply. And so that'll only apply it for the blue channel. The green is still there. It's very hard to see because now it's been uh, overwhelmed by the amount of blue. Now we're going to use this in relation to the Atlas page. I happen to know that this is a picture of the nucleus accumbens somewhere midway in its uh, extent from anterior to posterior. And so we're going to refer to our handy dandy Atlas. We're going to maybe scrunch this over so we can kind of refer to it here. Okay. And we are going to zoom in and you'll start to see some characteristic pieces. For instance, ACA, the anterior commissure, that is this bright blue dot or oval here with a little tail on it. We see that there's this hole up here that actually is part of the lateral ventricle, LV over here. We also see this dark, uh, sorry, this bright blue blob right here that is part of the islands of Kuleha, which happen to stain really darkly here as well. So we have a border of where the accumbens is. So we have ACBC, that's the accumbens core, and ACBSH, accumbens shell. We're going to include basically both of them in this whole uh, count process. The exact end of the accumbens shell over on the most lateral part, uh, we're going to just basically draw a very vague line where that is just because we don't have a full certainty of exactly where to end it, given the counter stain that we're using. And that's fine. I'm not too concerned with being super exact with the exact end of the lateral accumbens shell. So uh, one thing I do notice is that the angle looks a little wonky. For instance, the lateral ventricles a little bit uh, slanted down this way. And one little tell that I could kind of see at the very edge here is that this crevice is the separation between or the, the joining of the two hemispheres of the brain. The thing is that it's kind of pointing up at a 15 degree angle like this, and it should actually be straight up and down. 
And so it should look more like where this blue line is that's between the two hemispheres, uh, completely vertical. So I know that I need to actually rotate this. So this is in case you actually need to rotate something. And so you can do that in image J. It's a little funky in the way that it does it, but we're gonna give it a go. Uh, image, transform. We're going to go to rotate, not rotate 90 degrees, just rotate so we can get a specific uh, thing. We're going to go to uh, enlarge image, fill with background color, grid lines one, bilinear. I'm going to go with minus 16.5 to basically tilt it counterclockwise. And by hitting enlarge image, just make sure that it expands the canvas size so that when it does rotate, there aren't edges that are being cut off. Fill with background color just makes the background black so it doesn't pick up any sort of weird new colors. So let's see what it gives us. Uh, it's kind of doing a funky thing here. This is kind of what I was wondering about. So let's try minimizing and then bring it back up. Maybe going in and out. Okay. So it's kind of, it did this to me before. We're going to try transform, rotate, and we're going to then not do enlarge image. We're just going to say, we're going to rotate it back and forth once or twice. So we're going to hit okay. And then image transform, rotate, and then put a minus back on this. There we go. Okay, now it's kind of working as it should. If you feel like the angle is not quite right, you could rotate a little bit more, but I'm going with this for now. Now, what we can do is we can draw a selection box of where the accumbens is in order to basically create a cutoff for what we end up dumping from the image. So what I'm going to use now is the polygon select tool. This is basically like the more complicated aspect of the counting process. If a region were able to be boxed in a very clean square or a circle or oval shape, I really recommend doing that instead uh, of having to do the polygon select tool, because at least you have a lot more control over that. In this case, we're going to have to kind of figure out where things are based on a little bit of nissel staining and a little bit of the edges that we do see in the image. So to help us here, let's go to the plate view, click on the plate that corresponds to this. It's a little bit off center. So we're going to just look at the mirror opposite here. You'll notice that the edge of the accumbens shell starts from the bottom of the lateral ventricle up here. And then we can follow it going along here as this curves down. So if I'm to use the annotation tools to maybe make this a little bit easier to see, it would be basically here wrapping around through here, and then just kind of going like that. The accumbens core, uh, for instance, kind of wraps within that, but its backbone is going to be around here through there. This is not the cleanest separation. This will do generally, especially since I'm not too concerned with getting the exact lateral dorsal edge of the accumbens core. Uh, or figuring out again, the lateral accumbens shell. And if you could basically mimic this on this drawing up here, it does help. So we're gonna just sort of uh, keep that there. We're gonna go back to here. Oh, whoopsie doodles. Um, i turn that off for a second. And we're gonna go to the polygon select tool. And now we're gonna to try to redraw that. So we know that the islands of Kaleha are like this dark blob over here. We kind of see it over on this side as well. And that's where one edge is. So we're gonna start with the lateral ventricle and we could just keep clicking individual clicks rather than holding down. And it doesn't, again, it have to be a perfect encompassing of the shape. So we're just gonna do this, um, this, 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 it seems like this changes over here. I see a line here. So we're just gonna follow that line like so. And then we wrap it back around like that. Yeah, there we go. So again, kind of looks a little bit funky, not super round. We can go back to the Atlas page in order to better see that. Let me go ahead and clean up the annotation here. Clear all drawings. Uh, we go back to here, zoom out, go back to figure, and we zoom in 
and we kind of see that it should be a little bit more oval shape. So we can actually apply uh, an adjustment to each of the vertices that we drew. That's plural for vertex. And so what we can do is just kind of bump things out a little bit like this, or we make it a little bit more of a curve, like so. If we feel like this one reached down a little too far, then we can just adjust this back slightly, like so. Same thing with this one over here. OK. So now we have our big drawing of the accumbens in its entirety, both core and shell being included. And what we can do is, if we want to count all the particles within here, then we can basically just get rid of all the stuff in the outside. So in order to do this, though, we have to go back to the black and white images that we started with. And we have to separate out all this like really bright counter stain. Basically, the job of the counter stain has been fulfilled now. We don't really need it anymore. We already drew our brain region of interest. So we are going to now just cut that out. What we can do then is go to edit, clear outside. And now it only keeps what's in here from both channels, mind you. And then image, and we could just crop it down to just that piece right there. OK, so now we have our two channel image. This is now only the area of interest. What we're going to do now is we want to separate out the channels again. We go to image, color, split channels. We still have the uh, original, sorry, we have the, the two splits here. We have the blue, we don't really care about that. We have our target in green. This is what we do care about. So what we're going to do is we are going to basically, uh, go here, and then we want to make sure that the measurements of the image are set. So I already set this up before, but this will help you try to figure out what the real world measurements of things are. I know that different cameras and different images can be different uh, corresponding resolutions to the real world. In this camera's case, I happen to know that when we go to analyze set scale, I happen to know that for um every 0.533 pixels it's one micrometer so if you want to basically scale things which will be important for the counting functions in a little bit you need to go to analyze set scale and plug in the number that's appropriate for your camera at a certain magnification so this is at 4x magnification in my direction sheet have it here. If it's at 10x, then it's basically going to be double that pixels per micrometer. Uh, other cameras will have different magnifications because there will be like higher resolution cameras or something like uh, this one I used previously in a different lab. So uh, we will want to then go back to our set scale. We'll want to click global because if you're basically taking images and analyzing them and they're all the same magnification and all from the same camera, you'll just want to apply them all this way to the same session. It will clear this information. Uh, well, it'll save it to the image, but it will clear this information after you close image J. So do keep that in mind that when you start up a new session the next day, you'll have to kind of redo this step. So we're going to hit OK. So it's been applied to the image. We now have that being applied to this one. We can now threshold the image to get stuff to pop out. In order to kind of see what we're looking at, let's zoom in a little bit. So each of these green dots, the smaller ones, is a stained delta phos B particle. If we don't want to draw a new box, we just click the hand tool to pan around a little bit. I'm going to go up toward here because we see a lot of the green dots in this particular area, which is kind of interesting. So we can zoom out a little bit. And what else I'm going to do is I'm going to click image. Oh, sorry, I'm going to, yes, I'm going to click image adjust threshold. This will get the dots to really pop out and to drop out the background. It'll make it much more apparent as to what we're looking at. So we go to threshold. And we if it's if it's your first time starting up image A, like if you just installed it, then you might have to toggle a few things. For instance, you want it to be black and white, not red. You want dark background. And then it'll give you these numbers that it's going with. So it'll kind of default at some random values. Uh, as you see, when we try to play around with things, when you're trying to decrease the maximum under these settings, it doesn't really seem to do anything until you really drop it out. This is 
this basically cuts out the brightest parts of the picture. So anything that is super bright is cut out at 255. Anything that's moderately bright is cut out at 128. And up until we get to this point, it starts cutting out like the brightest parts inside the particles. That's why there are all these holes that start showing up. So we're not gonna mess around with the maximum though. That seems fine as it is. We wanna cut out all the riffraff background stuff. So I'm gonna click the minimum and I'm gonna draw that up. That was too much because now it cut out perhaps too many things. By the way, these uh, larger blobs, these happen to be some air bubbles or some other things in the tissue. We can pan around a little bit on the image. We see that it did keep this, which is fine. It kept a lot of these. We want to try to maximize what it keeps here without having too much stuff in the background popping out too. So let me just tweak this back a little bit. This ends up being too much. Uh, one problem here is that if you have something like this going on in the image, then this will keep things from actually being counted because the blob is too big. Everything's merged together. It can't separate out things as individual pieces. So we definitely want to get rid of anything that looks like that and minimize the size of the blobs as much as possible without losing the blobs that exist in the picture. So around 27 seems to be a good bet, maybe 28 just to be sure. Okay. So I am going to go ahead and hit apply. And now the threshold has been applied. We can close this box. We'll want to take down that in our notes here. So we have a few things to add to this. Uh, I'm just going to write them down right here. So we have 27, 255 were the numbers I used. We're going to say polygon. Uh -huh. Presume that was page like, what were we using? Mm, we're using about like 16, figure 16. Comments. File name analyze. We can go back to the original files. So this came from M460. M460 space SL1 SEC 3A accompanies. A, A, C, B. We don't have to include like the DFB or DAPI stuff since we merged those. Okay. Next up, um, we're going to leave all this blank. These were the things I applied. So I'm just going to hit copy paste. This is 460. This is M. Might want to even reverse these around. And then we should be good. So now we can conduct our cell counts now that we have our starting information. So we'll go to here and then we'll pull up the image J menu bar. Now um, we have to analyze particles. So let's go ahead and do that. I selected 20 to 200 micrometers. This is in micrometers, because that's basically what we had picked. We do not want pixel units, because then it'll just count the number of pixels, which is different from the micrometers. Circularity, uh, basically how much of a perfect circle it is, 1.0 being perfect circle, 0 being, I assume, flat line. Uh, 0.3 seems to be OK for picking up things that are a little bit weirdly shaped. Before we do this, actually, I forgot. Uh, image, sorry. Process binary watershed. So this will cut up any sort of larger particles or things that look like they're budding together as best as it can. So then we want to go to analyze particles. We've got two to 200, sorry, 20 to 200. This is in micrometers, not in pixel units. Circularity is 0.3 to 1.0. Uh, so perfect circle being 1.0, 0 0.3 being closer to a line or a very skewed oval, uh, but zero being a flat line. We want to select show outlines to show us wh what it counted and where in a separate new image. We want to clear the previous results, but we also want to select summarize. So now we hit OK. 
and we see what it included. Now, I can already tell there's a little bit of a problem here because even though it counted many particles all over the place, one issue that I see is that it had used the watershed function to fragment this thing, this being the anterior commissure. So this might be another reason um, to, this might be a reason to consider not using the watershed function because that will falsely inflate the cell counts that we have here. So it counts basically 967 cells, but perhaps it should be actually a lot less. So when we zoom in here, we see that these are all the fragments that were of the right size range. And we're about to get rid of all of them. So let's go ahead and see if we could undo the watershedding process. Doesn't seem like we can. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind that if you actually have that issue, you'll kind of have to go back to a previous iteration of the image and just kind of redo that. Um, it is a little bit obnoxious. So I recommend that if there is some sort of large fiber track type blob based on how the counter stain works, you consider maybe not watershedding and just trying to use the threshold process to get the particles to jump out and separate. All right. So that's the accumbens. Uh, we're going to hit not save uh, for that one. We don't care about this one. We're going to take our cell count amount uh, based on how many are in, in here, probably like 50 that were included from the anterior commissure. So we're going to cut those out. And we're going to go to roughly about 900 in this example. Ideally, you want to make sure that it's like a lot more clear as to how much was done. So if it has that sort of screw up, you're better off starting over and just kind of redoing it real quick. Notes, image, rotated, uh, minus 16.5 degrees. And there we have it. So that's one count of the whole region. Rather than doing um, something like... Uh, subregion counts where we end up drawing boxes at specific locations. So one example would be that we have this up and we end up uh, maybe thresholding it first. Then we go ahead and start drawing boxes like here, do account for that here, do account for that here, do account for that. Uh, you could see that the distribution of Delta Phos B staining is not thorough throughout this entire brain region. So if we zoom in, we see that there is a scarcity of it here for some reason. There is an extensive clustering of it at the top of the accumbens. And then there's more of a clustering down here that's intermingled with some fiber track regions. So grayer, fainter, larger blobs are just uh, some background uh, types of stuff from the tissue itself. So in this case, this is where I would opt instead to kind of go with what the average amount of cells per a certain amount of area is or are. And when we go back to our results, an important thing to maybe add to our spreadsheet is the total area of what the selection is. So we'll basically go with, uh, it says 559812. So we can kind of insert one new column and just say area and then 59812 would be our area and that way we could use this to figure out a average um counts per area metric later all right so the next order of business is another brain region in this case i've selected uh, in a different subject, the ventral pallidum. The ventral pallidum is interesting because in its more posterior parts, it can regulate pleasure, uh, other sorts of positive affect type stuff, as well as disgust. So we're gonna just go ahead and open up a few images from there. So we got one open and then two. I use VP for short in this case. So we have our combination of images again. We'll go ahead and combine them accordingly. 
So image, color, merge channels. The one that says DAPI in the name will be blue. And the one that says DFB in the name will be green. We'll say keep source images. We'll go ahead and do that. Now, the blue channel is actually a little bit oversaturated in this case. So we'll adjust it uh, to make it better, to make it a little bit more usable. So let's go ahead and do that. Image, adjust, color balance. We select channel two for blue. We crank up the minimum to cut out some of the background because the outer part here should be black, not a tinge of blue. So we're gonna do that here. Meanwhile, I'm gonna bring down the maximum to make the actual cell staining pop out. And that is closer to what it should look like. So we can turn down the minimum cutoff a slight bit, turn up the maximum because it's still a bit bright. And now we can kind of see some, uh, some general characteristics. One of the things that might pop out a little bit more easily in the original photo compared to here, and it might be a reason to maybe not use blue as a color, is this large strand here. So maybe what I'll do is, for simplicity's sake, we will go ahead and get rid of that image and we'll try to do this in a different color. So I'm just gonna click that out, click that out. We're gonna do uh, image, color, merge channels again. We're gonna make DFB green, but we're gonna keep the DAPI in gray because that's gonna be the most visible to us. We'll keep source images again. And so now we have this uh, green tinge from the DFB on top of a gray background. And in this case, we might not need to adjust color balance at all. We could still try to do that. So let's go ahead and give it a try. Uh, let's see, adjust color balance. And we'll go with channel two again. And so if I bring up the minimum a bit to drop it out of the background, that's pretty good. Gives it some nice contrast. We bring down the maximum, just a few hairs and that should do it. And we'll hit apply. So now we have to figure out, okay, where exactly in the brain is this? Well, I happen to know from looking under the microscope that this is ventral pallidum, and I'll have to convince you of that here. So let's go ahead, jump to the coronal sections. I'm guessing it's going to be around page 28. Let's take a look. No, further back, more like 34, 32 or 33. Yeah, probably 33 is the closest bet. So the strand that we see here, is actually similar. Well, it's the same thing as the ACA right here. So you can actually start to see this shape where there's an oval attached to a long tail, the anterior commissure, what it turns into as we go further back in the brain. And additionally, there are a few interesting weird things to note here. Sometimes when we cut the brains at this level, the optic chiasm the things that the optic nerves coming out of the eyes connect to and cross over at, this might actually not be attached anymore. So sometimes this actually comes off in the sectioning process. And so this may not be a good landmark to try to look out for. So generally you can ignore this until several pages later where it becomes optic tracked. And we'll see that in later examples. We do see third ventricle here. It's this tiny sliver but another weird thing that happens in the section process is that this will tend to be expanded. Uh, so it might actually be much more of like a, a big sort of half oval or something. And so we actually see that a little bit over here. Keep in mind that these brain tissues are cut across the hemisphere. So this is probably the cut between the hemispheres. So this is the midline of the brain. And then this curve right here is the third ventricle and the optic chiasm normally would be attached here. It's probably been torn off from again, the sectioning process. This tells us that the image is maybe a tiny bit tilted that may or may not matter. Um, we could try just doing the counts without having to reorient it though. So we have a general idea of where we are now and we see the ventral pallidum is this very large open area here. Now you notice 
It doesn't go all the way down to where the end of this tail is. It stops a little short of that, but it follows along the edge of this for the most part, uh, stops before the oval part here. So if we were to try to trace it out with our handy dandy bubble maker uh, polygon tool, we can do that in a bit. Before I do that even though, there is another feature to tell us where approximately it ends. Over here, we have some darker staining. And if I were to hazard a guess, that might be part of, let's take a look over here, probably the pyriform cortex all the way out here. So to kind of see this and what it looks like, let's go to the plate view real quick. Ah, so this is a different type of stain. Instead of nissel, this is colonesterase. It's going to pop out a lot more than what we have here. This is just a dappy stain. It's going to be a little bit more indistinct. But perhaps there are some helpful things here. Um, but maybe if we want to match what we're looking at on the image, we should go to the prior page first. This is probably a closer bet. So my impression is, and this is going to, of course, be a little bit harder. We've got, OK, one sec, draw. OK, so we've got our anterior commissure sort of weird thing with a tail situated over here. It's not the cleanest drawing, but this is about where I'm seeing it. We've got the pyriform cortex located over here, this dark band. And that is probably what we're seeing over here. This is pyriform cortex, uh, as far as what I can tell. That would mean that also we have another part over here, um, a, a white matter tract that's a little bit off to the side. And that would probably be about here. And so we're starting to put some of the pieces together. If we were to try to draw the ventral pallidum as far as where it generally is here, it would be likely about here through and around over there. Again, this is not a super clean shape, but let's go ahead and go back to the previous view. We're going to just sort of uh, click off annotation real quick. We're going to see how sloppy this looks when I go back in a second. Uh, let's zoom out, go back to figure, zoom in, and see if we can actually fit this into the shape that I drew. Uh, hand tool. And right about there. It's not ideal, but that is approximately where the pyriform cortex was popping up. And this is about where the anterior commissure was. And keep in mind that in the prior page, it's actually going to be smaller than this. So let's take a look. This is actually the page that should match up with a little bit more. So this is a slightly closer match. I might have overdrawn it a little bit too medially. Uh, and not drawn it quite deep enough because of course we don't know exactly where the section cuts off here. One of the other things that we have to watch out for is that we don't wanna draw in too much area. So I think having a conservative estimate of like where the area falls is fine. Additionally, one thing that we could default to doing is just taking representative boxes within the brain area of interest. Now, if you notice that the labeling in a brain area for Delta FOSB is very heterogeneous, so there are clumps of cells in some parts, and then there's a scarcity of cells in other parts rather than it being spread evenly throughout, I would suggest against doing small boxes across the area of interest. In that case, you're better off drawing a whole a uh, big thing across the whole thing, uh, a whole uh, polygon across the ventral pallidum, and then trying to count what's within there. Because uh, I do feel like it might end up being much more biased if you tried to do it with the individual multiple boxes that are much smaller. So having an idea of what we're trying to loop in here, let's go ahead and give that a shot over here. Let me just go ahead and clear some of these annotations. And go back to here. And we can now use the polygon tool to do what we want to do with a little bit better control and finesse than what I had going on. So we know that the ventral pallidum is happening about here. 
through here. In a Nissel uh, stain, it might be a little bit more apparent and it might stand out a little bit better than what I'm drawing here. So we know it stops a little ways before we get to that part. And it sweeps up something like that. So this is a decent approximation for where the ventral pallidum should stand. Um, you can always just kind of look back to the original image, see if it stands out better in the original compared to this. We do have some very blatant air bubbles that hopefully won't come up in the analysis. Hopefully they'll be able to be ignored, but that's one of the key points of when you're trying to cover slip sections that you make sure that there are no air bubbles and that if there are, uh, you make sure that the mounting medium you're using stays liquid so the air bubbles can kind of rise if you let the slide sit uh, upright for a little while. All that said, let's give this a go. So as per before, what we're going to do is we are going to just crop to the, oh yes, clear outside first. We are going to crop to this, and then we are going to separate the channels again. So image, color, split channels. So we got our green and gray. And now what we can do is we can threshold this one as we did before. So image adjust threshold regular threshold. We got dark background, black and white, we're good. Let's adjust the minimum. And that makes a huge difference by just clicking it a few times. So that's pretty notable. And that suggests that the labeling in this region is relatively faint, but definitely not something we wanna overlook. So let's go ahead and play around with this a bit. This might be good. This might be okay. Now. That's just one click, one number difference. And normally it's not that fine of a difference. There are some advantages to selecting either of these. In this case, it looks like more stuff is popping out, but the downside is that if particles are, any of these blobs are too close together, if they're basically touching each other, then they look to the program like one larger blob. And as a result, it may not count it because it's beyond the limit of how big it should be that we set. If we tweak it up, another step, we'll definitely shrink down the blobs so that things are smaller and separated. But additionally, it'll get a little bit more tricky where we've lost some information, we've lost some data. One way that I have gotten around this again is by applying the uh, process binary watershedding tool. It's just that even though that will draw lines and split up blobs that look like they are ovals that are stuck together, it will also try to split up things like this air bubble outline here. And that can be problematic because it'll start counting pieces of the air bubble as actual stained cells. And we don't want it to do that. So I'm gonna actually avoid using the watershed function here. We'll just have to pick uh, whichever one seems like it best represents the cell counts. So let's take a look here. I think that based on the amount of stuff that drops out when I click it up, I'm going to keep it at 12. And hopefully we won't lose out too much on counts. So let's go ahead and apply. That's 12 and 255. So we hit apply. We close this window out. I go to our spreadsheet here. I have a few things to write down here. Um, first, this is F. Uh, 180 VP, uh, sorry, F108, F108, yes. <laughs> so DFB is still in fluorescene, counter stain is still daffy. We don't need to worry about the red fluorophore, but I'm just going to label it because I know what it is. Uh, section thickness, file folder, F108, 8-2021, uh, this one is just F108 VP, just because it doesn't really have a complicated file name. Sometimes we put the section number and the slide number in there, that's what this SL1, slide number one of probably three slides, section number kind of uh, counting sections from left to right, top to bottom in reading order. 
And then sometimes we throw in like a region name or otherwise an atlas page. But you just basically go with what the file name is so we can find what it is. I estimated that this uh, is around 32. So I will say actual atlas page is 32. Region, VP. Polygon box. And we'll find out the area in a bit. I added a separate area thing here. The thresholding, we went for 12-255. And we will find out the rest, my initials being plugged in here. No image rotations needed, so we're good there. OK, so we should be good to count. Let's give it a go. Ah, yes, we didn't calibrate the uh, image parameters, so we'll have to do that real quick. And just to remind myself, since this is a new session for me, since the last video snippet, uh, 4x 0.533 pixels per micrometer. So let's go ahead and set that. Analyze, set scale, 0.533. I'll just put a zero in front of that. And then UM, we'll just click global for now. Hit OK. And now we go back here and we get the micrometer measurements. And this kind of makes a little bit of sense. So we're basically saying that the ventral pallidum at this point in the brain is close-ish to two millimeter to two um yeah, two millimeters wide and close-ish to two millimeters tall. We could check the atlas numbers here because on the figures it actually says that. So from here to here, roughly shy of two millimeters. And from here to here, we can kind of assume also similarly roughly shy of two millimeters. So that seems to be about right for sizing. Okay, so then next up, we actually do the count final. Let's give it a go. Get our tool boil brick. And then we click analyze particles, clear results, summarize. We want outlines so we can get a representation of what it has selected and what it has not. Uh, I believe our numbers were 20 to 200 last time. We leave pixel units unchecked. Let's go back to here. I know I edited this. So let's see here. 20 to 200 micrometers. All right. Let's hit OK and then see what it gives us. OK, 261 cells. That looks like a decent smattering of things. We can compare it to the original image. So when we compare these, when they're size-wise similar, we see that it counted a lot of things that we feel like it should. Uh, let's go ahead and zoom in on this. It counted these as two separate ones, and it is likely that these are two separate ones, one that was probably carved off by my polygon selection tool. We have a giant blob of them over here where a lot of them were probably not selected. Meanwhile, some other ones that were very small were probably selected. So. I think that it is a decent trade-off. You're not going to ever get it to be perfect. It is not an exact science. It is going to be the best of uh, application. So you're not going to guarantee that you're going to count every cell accurately. You're going to try to minimize the margin of error in this sort of situation. And I feel comfortable that we've done that here. All right, so we don't have to save either of these images, if up to you if you want to, but we don't want to overwrite any original images. But we have a few important numbers here. We have total count is 261, and total area is 21,000-ish something. So I'm just going to uh, copy those numbers in. Additionally, you could always set it up into a spreadsheet so that you can just copy paste these. But uh, I think if I click on any of the single cells, it'll kind of throw a fit, as you just saw. So OK, we're just going to plug that in here. 261 and then full area was 21472. Don't really care about the decimal places in that. And I set it up to do cells per micrometer squared, which is going to be something kind of arbitrary in general. Should be something other than zero. Interesting. Hmm, it does seem rather low. 
Uh, let's check the formula. T, da, da, ah, because there's nothing in over here. So we just plug something in there, and there we go. That should do it. And for simplicity, I'm just going to drag this all down here to fill it with ones in the meantime. All right. So there we go. Uh, that's the ventral pallidum and how I would tackle that. So next portion is going to be the next brain region that we have on our list. So next one that we have up is the amygdala. And in this case, we're taking a image of the better part of the amygdala, all subregions, as much as we can fit into one picture at 4x magnification, or technically 40x if you include the camera eyepiece, all that stuff. So we got our two images here. We've got our DAPI, we've got our Delta Foss B. I've already pre labeled some things onto this row to save some time. So F should be a 301. That doesn't seem right. This is in F301. Okay. F301, fluorescein, la la la. We've got our folder. We've got our specific file name. There are multiple files being used, but they're appended with DAPI or DFB. So I just left those out. We'll have to find our Atlas page that this belongs to. So I'm going to judge this based on where the amygdala normally is. Now, one other feature that I have in the spreadsheet is that we've classified where the various brain regions approximately are in the atlas. So if we're looking for something like amygdala, you can kind of just scroll down. It's going to be a little bit more posterior than some places. And somewhere around here, here we go, central amygdala, CEA, sometimes it's in the atlas or in the literature. The CEA, central piece of the amygdala, is... 51 through 55. Now, the amygdala as a whole is going to stretch well beyond that. So we probably will add another entry to this. And I'll probably have to add some more information at a later point. By the way, these are pieces of information that we used uh, in order to publish this paper back in 2020 and for some project that I had worked on in the last year. So yeah, um, first order business is finding page 51 through 55 in our atlas. Scroll down. And here, we're going to just go to the middle of that approximately. Here is about where the amygdalar subregions are. So there's kind of a lot to look at here. There's all these divisions as there is in this brain atlas, but the amygdala includes this here, this here, and basically all of this down in through here. So it's got all these different subparts. And I'm not too concerned with differentiating between the subparts at this time. It's not to say that they're not important, but there's a lot to figure out between them. So let's go ahead and hover over some of these abbreviations to make sure that they're still amygdala associated. Uh, so we have lateral amygdaloid nucleus, basolateral amygdaloid nucleus, basolateral amygdaloid nucleus. So I know these are all amygdala. These are the central amygdaloid nuclei. So the CEA that we saw before can be subdivided even further. This one technically isn't part of the amygdala, but for ease, if we're trying to encompass all this area, it may end up being counted. We've got medial amygdala down here. We've got basal medial amygdala here. And then we've got basal lateral amygdala still down over here. So it's taking up all this wide region. The only things that aren't part of it are a few other little regions here and there. So that would include things like uh, probably the AST. Yeah, amygdalostriatal transition area. It's a little bit unclear. Intercalated nucleus of the amygdala. These are, again, very minor regions that we're not really going to focus on for our purposes in this counting project. 
So we're going to try to focus on as much as we can in the picture. Now, you might be wondering, OK, how do we even begin to figure out where to draw lines around this really wonky shape? We have some more guides to follow. One of the biggest guides here, you see this, uh, let's get annotations back on. And maybe we should change the color to something contrasting a bit. This thing right here is a large fiber tract region that may appear in our image. We'll have to see if it's there. Another very important landmark for us to use is the optic tract over here. So this goes out from being the optic nerves from the retina, optic chiasm where they connect, and then they split apart and go deep into the brain in the form of the optic tract. This tends to be the most pronounced thing that is adjacent to the amygdala that will help us determine where we are, and particularly if the uh, image is at a weird angle. Another feature is that the optic tract does change its shape very uh, reliably as you flip forward or backward through the atlas. Before I show you that, there is another landmark that may be helpful if it's visually apparent, which would be the internal capsule slash cere cerebral peduncle. It, it tends to have two different names depending on where you are in the atlas. So we've got these three key factors here. Let's see if we could find any of these first in our Nissel drawing. Well, yes, we'll do the Nissel first. And then we'll get a feel for how other features change as we flip between pages. So take a moment to try to see if you can identify the shapes that we were looking at before. So go ahead and pause, take a moment, see if you could kind of just visually or mentally with your eyes draw out where the shapes are. Having taken that pause, I'm going to draw the shapes right now. We have the basolateral amygdala here in this general vicinity. We have the central amygdala here. We have medial amygdala compartments. I'm probably going to have a little bit more trouble trying to draw that stuff, but it's going to generally be throughout here. Our optic tract is over here. You could see that it's a lot easier to see compared to a lot of other things. So the optic tract is that sliver there. We'll do another color like a light blue. This one here is that internal capsule slash cerebral peduncle thing I mentioned before. So that goes all the way up into here, so to speak. Uh, it actually might extend more like this. It's a little hard to tell at this level. Additionally, another fiber tract region that I mentioned before, which is an extension of the corpus callosum, exists over here. And so that's this faint white line over on this side that ends right about around the base of where the basolateral amygdala ends. So for basis of comparison, we could try to flip this back to the uh, Atlas figure view to see how good or bad I drew these. So let's go ahead and see how well I did. I don't have much confidence, but you know, I think it's worth a look. Let's zoom in a bit more. It's not too bad. It's not the greatest fit, but my boundaries were okay, except for medial amygdala. Now, the thing is, I kind of skewed it like this, so we see optic tract. In this case, um, it might be that the image was a little bit more zoomed in. Yeah, I think this is probably closest to what the image was. So this is about what we were seeing in the image. Maybe I should have drawn the central image a little larger. Case in point is that if we cared about dividing the subregions here, this is how we would draw it. But I recommend just sort of drawing something that uh, collects all of these areas together. I should have drawn the yellow line here closer to the optic tract. It should have been basically butting up against it. Uh, I probably could have not drawn it quite as deep, but then I should have connected it a little bit more ventrally and laterally up to where this uh, green blob is here. So if I were to redraw that now, 
a better fit might be something more like this and this in order to encompass all the stuff that we want to encompass here. Basically what I'm saying is that rather than drawing three rather complicated shapes, you can draw a polygon that encompasses all these areas relatively liberally. So you can draw something that is basically the combination of all these shapes without having to do them individually. If you were working on a project where you can, were concerned more about these specific subregions of the amygdala, then we would want to do this. And there may be reason to, if the Delta Fos B labeling looks like that matters. Let's take a quick look, in fact, because that is something that does come up. In the case of the amygdala, we do see some features here, and some of them pop out even in the regular Delta Fos B labeling. So we have our fiber tract coming down this way. We have our optic tract going here at an angle. And so the amygdala regions would be basically about here, looping down through here. We've got central amygdala, probably about here. We've got medial amygdala regions. There may be distinctions between the subregions. So I think what you can try doing at this time is maybe trying to count within the subregions. And then we can just sort of figure out whether we want to combine them later or not rather than drawing a larger shape. But either way, whichever one you decide on, you want to label it very clearly. So what I'm going to try to do right now very briefly is use our Nissel and try to form some shapes. And I'll try to do it in three separate images. So let's give that a go as well. We'll also want to make sure that our Atlas page fits up well. And so that's where the optic track comes into play. So watch the shape of OPT here. So as I flip anterior, so more forward in the brain, the optic tract becomes much more wedge shaped, or what well, I should say more flattened. Um, and that's as it slowly comes toward the middle and connects to the optic chiasm. And this is as we're going for, forward in the brain, more anterior until we get to the very front tip of the brain. So it first appears, here is optic chiasm. And so as we go more far back into the brain, it finally splits and then it starts going up into the brain. And as we go deeper, it becomes much more wedge shaped. And in this case, page 56 might be actually a better match with what we're looking at here because this is a much more steep wedge that we have going on. So we see that we have the amygdala, the basal lateral amygdala is this general triangle with a knob on the bottom here. We've got the central amygdala still having its same similar shape. We've got medial amygdala reaching down in and through here. So I'm going to try to draw these three things separately, and then I'll do one go around where it's all of them together. And we'll see if the counts all combine appropriately. Before I do that, let me go ahead and prep my sheet here. So we're going to actually have uh, three consecutive entries then, or well, I should say four technically. So we're going to go with first um, brain region. We're going to say BLA for basal lateral amygdala, CEA for central amygdala, and MEA for medial amygdala. And then we'll just say amyg or yeah, amyg for amygdala. And these will all be polygons, most likely. So we'll go ahead and fill those in. So let's give it a shot. Uh, first, we'll merge our images. We'll color adjust the DAPI, making sure that it fits. We'll keep it in grayscale, but we need to drop out some of the background. We could see that there's a lot of uh, this gray haze that would be best subtracted out from the image. So Let's go ahead and image, color, merge channels, green, DFB. As we saw in the last case, keeping DAPI as gray makes it a little bit more visible. So we'll do that. Keep source images. That's all well and good. We do see that the green stands out really well. We might not have to do much figuring out with thresholding, but that does tend to make things a little trickier for us as far as trying to figure out what we're going to do here. So we can actually 
turn off the visibility of the green channel. So let's go ahead, color channels tool. We can just shush it for now as we adjust the various things going on here. So let's go ahead and now adjust color balance. We will not pick that, we will pick channel two. We will bring up the minimum to give better contrast. That's a lot better. So you can kind of see the line coming down this way. You can see the basolateral amygdala forming this. The central amygdala would be about here and the medial amygdala would be looping down in through here. So this makes our job a little bit easier. Let's see if lowering the maximum helps us at all. Uh, maybe, don't wanna make it too bright. So we'll apply that. And the green channel is still in the background. It's just, we've uh, obscured it from view. So we'll turn that back on after we figure out our drawings here. So, well, we'll just kind of do this the same way a few times. So image. Uh, we will draw our polygon tool. So I'm going to go with basolateral amygdala first. Click that, click this. Um, oh, I think it's because the channels tool is still up here. Let's turn that off for a second. And then we will draw our polygons again. Thankfully, it lets us. So let's go ahead and do that here. Kind of goes off screen a bit. Eh, there we go. Come on. And we draw it up around the backbone here. So we have basolateral amygdala. Uh, channels tool. We bring this back on, edit, clear outside, image crop, image color, split channels, get rid of this. And now we have our thing for the basal lateral. So let's give it a shot. We will go to analyze particles. We still have the global settings applied. We see the micrometers in the bar up here. Uh, and then we just give it a go. Oh wait, threshold, yes. Things I need to remember to do in order. So let's tweak this a little bit. Got to have the right balance of having enough visible but not too many that are actually touching or merged. So that might actually be somewhere close to, I would say 93 potentially. In this case, we don't have to worry too much about air bubbles. So this is where the watershed function might be appropriate to use. So I'm gonna hit apply, close this, analyze the process binary watershed. We see that it drew a lot of little lines here. We see that it did separate the air bubble, but I don't think that added enough particles to make too much of a difference. So then analyze particles, do it. It counted a decent amount. That looks pretty good. And that is 614 over 637. Plugging in here, 614, let's see, 637, 614. Thresholding was 93 to 255 in this case. Okay. So next order of business, we can't hit undo on this. That's what sucks with image J. You can't really just do that. So let's go ahead, go back a bit. We can close this out. We'll just merge our channels again, image, color, merge channels and we'll just do this um dfb gray is the dappy keep source images what we could do is we could probably create a few different composites this way and that way we'll just have three images that we'll just edit down accordingly later so let's go ahead and just do that in mass 
We'll minimize this image color merge channels. So we'll do the same thing again. It'll be uh, DFB DAPI hit OK. Got another composite image color merge channels. Then we got DFB DAPI hit OK. So we've got three different composite images. I minimize a few of them. Keep them down there. We'll do the same thing as we did before. Color channels tool. Turn off channel one for now. Uh, adjust color balance. Channel two. And we saw that raising it to about seventy. Yeah, I would even say like ninety was good. And then popping this down to two thirty-five. So ninety, two thirty-five. Apply. We're going to go ahead and do that to the other ones real quick. So image color or adjust color balance channel two 90 235 hit apply okay Minimize that again, and then image color. Yep, adjust color balance. Channel two, if it lets me. Ninety two thirty five. Apply. Close. Minimize. So again, we will draw in our shape. And so our shape is approximately here. Image, color, turn back on the green channel to make sure it's not omitted. Edit, clear outside. Image, crop. color, split channels, ditch the gray channel, keep the green, image adjust threshold, gives us an automatic starter of 70. We will bring that up a tiny bit carefully. This is tricky. Yeah, this one's very tricky. Because as much as we try to bring up these, we end up losing out on these because they're all merged together. And the watershed function is not perfect. So it's not going to split blobs that look very ovoid. So we have to make some tough decisions here. So I'm going to put it about 85, maybe 80. All right. So hit apply at 80. 80 Five. Okay. Go back, close this, go back here. Um, we will try our watershed function on this process, binary watershed. As you see, it didn't do terribly much. Uh, it did split up this one here, I could tell. It split up this one. It may have split up this one, but it didn't split up a ton of them. This is why you shouldn't necessarily expect the watershed function to be a really good problem solver, because it may not break them up appropriately. You're better off trying to get the larger blobs to drop out um, uh, in order to get like smaller amounts that are able to be counted. Or basically, you're trying to balance out whatever, whatever situation gives you the maximum amount that you can count. And you try to do that as consistently as possible. You don't want to try to skew it higher or low across different subjects. You always want to try to get the best balance of trying to get the most cells to count out of this. Without further ado, let's go ahead and do this. See what it gives us. It did an OK job. Oh, polygon selection tool still going. So, OK. 
it did an okay job. It definitely missed out on a few things, but it did count some of the tinier things, which was important for why we kept it rather um, low as far as the minimum, not even really that low, but still. So I'm satisfied with this result. Count was 186, uh, 16, 561. So 186.16561. All righty. And then what we can do is we can just close all that out. So close, close, close. Don't save. Bring up another composite. We will draw to the best of our ability medial amygdala now. Uh, we will turn off the green channel briefly. Image, color, channels tool, turn off channel one. So we drew central amygdala around here. Medial amygdala then would be in the remaining portions. So we're gonna set that to be about throughout here, down through where the image is basically off the edge. And I'm going to just cut it up to here where we have the basolateral amygdala a little bit more apparent. Okay. Oop. There we go. Let's stretch that up to there and move you over there. Good. So uh, this will do. And we'll turn back on green channel, close this image. Uh, oh, edit, clear outside, image, crop, uh, image, color, split channels, close, image, adjust threshold, threshold balance seems to be pretty good as it automatically is. I'm going to stick with this. So that is 67 to 255. Hit apply. 67, 255. Good. Close. Take image. Uh, still trying to run the watershed function. Hopefully it doesn't mess things up with this air bubble here. We will see. Process, binary, watershed. It doesn't chunk that up too much. It may have given us a few extra cells here and there that split up. Analyze particles. All good. Hit OK. Decent representation. Satisfied with this. Uh, I'm going to close that. We need the numbers here. So that's 595. Fifty-one six oh seven. All right. So then we try to accomplish uh, accomplish the uh, whole amygdala and see how that goes. So we'll close this out, and we will just draw around the whole darn thing. So let's give that a try. Which color channels tool? Turn off, close, polygon select tool. So we know the basolateral amygdala starts about here. We know the central amygdala arcs up about here. The medial amygdala stitches down around here. And then the basolateral amygdala kind of does a no, 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 not done yet. Kind of does a thing over here. So this encompasses a very large area, as you can see, which makes subdividing it maybe uh, a more attractive thing to do. But we're going to count this regardless. Go back to image, color, channels tool, put back on the green, close that, edit, clear outside, image, crop, image, uh, color, split channels, get rid of the gray. Image, adjust, threshold. 
I am going to go with what it tells me just about. Let's see what happens if we tick it up to about 80. Losing out on a lot of small ones and not really breaking up the big ones. So we're going to go back down to 76 that it gave me. Maybe a little lower to see if it gives us anything better to go with. Interesting. I might actually have it set to 71. Let's try that. 71, 255. Apply. Close. 71, 255. Analyze particles. Hit OK. 1,118. Area, 100,310. And looking at this, it's definitely less than the sum of these. So the sum of these would be closer to about 1,400-ish. So we got 1,100. So we could see that we, we did miss out with some of the precision, but I think that's still an acceptable margin of error. We might have also included some pockets of uh, space that normally were not counted by all the individual counts that we have here. So that's the amygdala nutshell. It's up to you whether you want to do subregions or the whole amygdala and then subdivide it later, but this is one way to go about it. For our next area of interest, we have the lateral habenula. And so this structure can range for a bunch of pages. Uh, if we take a look here, piece of the lateral habenula is right about here. We'll see it appear about as early as page 55, I believe, maybe 54. Yeah, so tiny sliver there. Generally, I prefer to try to take images from around uh, page 60 here and close to that. We notice that as we go further back, the lateral habenula still exists for a little bit of a ways into posterior parts of the hypothalamus, but then quickly disappears before we get to page 70. So again, I'd say that between page 60 to 64, uh, we're gonna get the brunt of the lateral habenula. One thing that's really helpful, though, is that the nissels actually make it stand out, especially when you have the medial habenula in particular being prominent in those nissel stains, uh, much more so right next to it. So we have cholinesterase stain, here we go. So in a nissel stain, this very dark structure happens to be the medial habenula. And this image here, <clears throat> this is just the unaltered DAPI image. Uh, this would be the medial habenula. Then taking a look here, you could actually kind of see the outline of the lateral habenula. So let me go ahead and just draw that in real quick. Lateral habenula would be basically here. And then when we pull it up on this window, lateral habenula would be about here. It's a little bit sloppy on this side. The line should kind of cut more like here. But Essentially, this is the region of interest for lateral habenula in this one section. Keep in mind that these brain sections, they are uh, split between the hemispheres. So we're only looking at the, um, the rat's right hemisphere uh, or the left side in this case. And we don't have an accompanying right side. In this case, we have both hemispheres visible uh, from this nissel stain from the rat brain atlas. So let's go ahead and get counting with that. Um, we'll do the same sort of setup as before, where we'll combine the uh, overlay and then we'll just cut it out. We might not even really need to do any color balancing with the uh, DAPI image because it's coming in pretty clearly. So let's go ahead, image, color, merge channels. Gray will be our DAPI, green will be our DFB. Keep source images just in case we need them. We draw our polygon tool around the area of interest.
making sure not to include the medial habenula unless we have reason to do so. And then image, go ahead and just uh, edit clear outside. Image crop. Image color split channels, get rid of the DAPI. Do the threshold, do the counting, and voila, you'll kind of have the usual gist of it. 